Today's scripture reading is taken from Romans chapter 11, verse 15 to 29. 11 verse 15. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap of the olive root, do not boast over those branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he would not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut off of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be arrogant, uh, sorry, ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be safe, as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account, but as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gift and his call are irrevocable. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we want to thank you this morning as we come to a very difficult passage in the scripture. But Father, I know, Lord, that there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from here, how you dealt with the Jews and also how you dealt with us Gentiles, Lord. I mean, know the Father, Lord, that you show, Lord, the equal amount of love, justice, and mercy. And I know the Father, Lord, that your character will always persist. And so, Father, we pray, Lord, that this morning, Lord, you will teach us to learn from your word. Because from your word, Father, Lord, we have our assurance. We have uh, the promise that God has given to us to hold on to. And that's where our faith, Lord, is rooted in. So, Father, we pray, Lord, this morning that you will speak to all of us. We want to thank you, Lord, as we commit, Lord, this time in the hand. And I pray, O oh, Father, Lord, that you will give us understanding, Lord. We thank you for this. We ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I developed the interest of horticulture from my father when I was very young. Now, what is horticulture? It is the art or practice of garden cultivation and management. You see, my father you know, was a very talented man. You know, I always admire my father because he's a jack of all trade. And despite having just only a few years of primary education in a Chinese school, he could read very well. And he learned a lot of skill all by himself, by watching, you know, and he's a very observant person. And one of the talents that I picked up from my father was horticulture. Now, my father 
learn the art of bud grafting uh, and experiment it on a rambutan tree. I remember it's still a rambutan tree. And it was a success. No, he actually bugger from different variety of rambutan onto the rambutan tree and then he began to bear different kind of rambutan. And it's amazing. And then he started to do experiment on different kind of plants, including flowers. And he cultivated bokin villas. And he had bud crafted seven different colors onto the plant. And it's beautiful, just like one of these. In fact, it was so attractive that our neighbors who passes by will always stop there and say, and admire my father's masterwork and comment, wow, so nice, huh? where you bought it. Right? My father said, you know, I, he cultivated, he bud crafted it, you know, and asked my father about the secret how to do bud grafting. In fact, it was so good to an extent and attractive, and some of them got stolen <laughs> at night. And people passes by, you know, and they took the whole part. My father's heart was broken, you know. So he began to tie it with wire, you know, <laughs> by the, so that nobody can take it away. All the hard work he placed inside. And one of the talent I picked up from my father was this culture. Now, what has haughty culture got to do with today's sermon? In chapter 11. Paul also talked about haughty cultural ethic. Here we see when he used the example of bud grafting to illustrate the relationship of the Jews and the Gentiles in God's salvation plan. And in these 15 verses here in the middle of Romans chapter 18, we are going to look at it. Now, I say it's a very difficult passage to explain, but I believe it is not impossible for us to understand. But that will demand a lot of our attentions to listen this morning and examine the context of this passage and the metaphor of horticulture that Paul utilized here to explain. So let us all roll up our sleeve, you know, and start digging in in this passage. And I believe the Lord has a great deal to teach us to this passage about how God dealt with the Jews and how God dealt with Gentiles and how we should react. Now let's begin this morning by reviewing the question that we ended with in the previous sermon that we asked about the position about these Jews about Israel. What happened to them? I mean, end up with these questions that ask, you know, did they stumble? Stumble so as to fall beyond recovery in verse 11. Remember the questions? Now, if you can recall, in the earlier part from verses 1 to 14, Paul brought out the subject on the position of the Jews and the Gentiles. And there are three very important points that is made in this text here. And these three statements will help us get a better insight and handle on some of this very important issue that we all are dealing with. And I often ask about these questions. Pastor, what do you think about the Palestinian issue? What is happening right now? You know, and, and I don't want to get involved in the what we call you know conversation of argument over it. Eh? How about the Jews? You know what they're doing is right or wrong? How about relationship with them? Should Christians be supporting to them? But I think this morning the passage will explain to us. Let's find out huh? the first uh, statement that help us to remember. Remember that the Jews is not, is not being abandoned by God. They are now under discipline, but it's only temporarily. When I say temporary, it's not three days. It's not four years. It could be ten years. It could be a hundred years. I don't know, but they're still under discipline. But concerning the Gentiles, how about the Gentiles? The Gentiles is now enjoying salutations. 
and enjoying the blessing that just don't belong to them, belong to someone else and it was given to them right now. And we are enjoying it. Therefore, we mustn't be arrogant and be proud. And that was happening to the Christians in those days in the early church. And the third thing that we must remember in the passage, it was the Lord is now working with the Jews as well as the Gentiles and we find his plans unfathomable. And we will find it more in detail later down the passage that we're going to explain on. Now how? How do we know that God is doing all these three things? How do we know? And the following passage here gives us the answer to the question that has been posted to us. How is, do I know God is doing all these things? Now let's go to the answers. Now we need to think through this. Huh? We look at this passage. And each point of this passage in Romans chapter 11, verses 15 to 25, to 25 actually revolve around this central idea. Now keep this central idea in mind. Uh, to help you understand the passage. That is, what the Gentile Christian now enjoy was once reserved for the Jews. A promise that is made for the Jews. And in the future, it will be theirs again. So God is not removing this blessing for them. In the future, whatever God promised, God will give, but it's the time when God is going to give to them. And this controlling thoughts comes to the four keys that we're going to look in the passage this morning. So let's take time to study and examine each one of them. Let's begin first with the context of the passage. Now it's very important for us to understand the context. Uh, if we call it out of context, we can say anything we want. But all this while, we all know what the context is all about. And this context, you know, huh, is to answer the question just now we have just posed. Is God done away with the Jews? In verse 11, let's examine it again. To the Christians, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? No hope. They are hopeless. And Paul answers straight away and he said, not at all. Absolutely not. Because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Now this verse alone informs us that these unsaved Jews, though they are being hardened by God at this moment, but they are not irretrievably lost, meaning eternally lost. As a nation, they have been temporarily set aside so that the Gentiles might gain what the Jews have lost. That's what happened. Because the Jews refused. Because of the unbelief. Because they rejected the Messiah whom they've been waiting for. And God said, if you do not want the blessing, I will pass it on. Huh? We hold it back to the Gentiles. And because of rejection, we have an early recipient of the grace of God. <laughs> Can you see that? God is good. But all of this that happens here has been performed, he says, for the sake of who? Even in the midst of giving this blessing, it's for the sake of the Jews. Again, not of the Gentiles. For through the salvation of the Gentiles, the Jews are being provoked to jealousy so that they might be saved as well. Can you imagine? You've been waiting, 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 waiting huh, for the thing to come. And when we come, you know, at the door set, we say, oh, it's not mine. And then you throw it and give it to your friend. And the friend opens it. Oh, it's a BMW. <laughs> it's supposed to be. I wanted to have one. And now I miss it. Gave it away. Ayo, I shall hold me back. Ayo, I shall open and see before I give it away. And that's exactly what happens here. Now take a look in the following verses, from verses 12 to 15. Huh? For if their transgression means riches for the world, and the loss means riches to the Gentile, how much greater riches will their full inclusions bring? 
I am talking to the Jews. He's reminding the Jews. Inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. If, for if their rejections brought reconciliation to the world, what will the acceptance be but life from the dead? This passage tells us that God has not done with the Jews. The time is coming. If you're looking what is happening right now, the event that is happening right now, and the focus and concentration in the Middle East, we will know that God is doing something. And God is longing for the Jews to repent of their unbelief and become the recipients of the blessing that was originally theirs. Chinese say, uh, but it's not true for them. Uh, even though they missed the first flight, God is still coming back for them. And after confirming God's faithfulness to the Jews and His eternal plan for His chosen people referring to the nation of Israel, Paul used the metaphor of the first food offering and also this what we call horticulture, bud grafting, to illustrate how God used the rejection of the Jews to become a channel, a channel of blessing to the Gentiles. Now let's find out from this metaphor, what is he talking about? And the first metaphor that Paul employed is the, horticul is the offering, the first fruit offering. And this is recorded in, <clears throat> in the first part of verse 16. <coughs> and this is what it says here. Let's take a look of it. In verse 16, if the part of the dough offered as first fruit is holy, then the whole batch is holy. I was thinking to my mind, what is this about? How does this got to do uh, so I will go back and do some research work. What is this offering about? What is this first fruit offering? See, in order for us to understand the meaning of this illustration, we need to have some background information. Now, when the Jewish farmer raised a grain crop for that year, the first thing he do when the crop is ripe, he will cut the shoot and then bring it to the priest as an offering. And that is a first fruit offering. So the crop is growing from January up to July. Finally, all is ripe. What you see is all golden. And the first thing you do, you cut the first shoot and then bring it as an offering to the priest. To who? To God. You see, under the Mosaic law, this crop sample was to be given to God as a first fruit offering. As the way I say, Lord, I thank you for providing this for me. Uh, and the rest, no, no, that comes along with it. And that's what I mean. And in this way, the entire crop was recognized as a provision from God. I thank God for all this provision. And now, with a heart of thanksgiving, I give you this first fruit. And that's where, you know, our tithing comes from. The God will give us the first thing we do before we deduct our EPF income tax, you know, installment house, installment for car, installment for a uh, 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 down real, I don't know what it is, you know. Huh? You give it to God the first one ten. And the Jews follow a similar procedure when they begin to bake food that is made from this grain. And they start to make a dough. And the first batch of the dough was to be offered to God as a peace offering. It was simple, a sample of all that would be cooked that season for God's glory, because the food come from God. Now, with this background that we can have, it is not difficult to understand the meaning of Paul. Elias. Why did he use this? You see, the first piece of dough here actually refer to who? Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. 
They are the first door. Why? They are the one who are recipients of righteousness through faith. And then the rest of the door, which is the lump, the big lump, represents the nation of Israel. And so the truth being taught is that if the first generation of Israel were being set apart to God, then the entire nation that follows too will belong to God. And the Jews always were, presently are, and forever will be God's chosen people. God will not done away with them. Because that is God's choice. He chose. So keep that in mind. And the second metaphor he employed is the horticulture gardening cultural ethic here. Let's take a look at this. And this is found in the second half of verse 16 and 17. And this one speaks to both the Jews and the Gentiles. And this is what the passage begins with. He said, if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now you look at the tree. The tree makes up of three things, you know, right? You see the roots down there, the main trunk, the branches, then comes the leaf. And this whole thing forms the tree. And it says here, if the root is holy, so are the branches. Because the branches, the leaves, all receive its nutrients from where? The roots, right? Take it up. And so what does this passage mean here? In regard to the word root, the for, word for nation of Israel, it stands for Abraham. Abraham is the physical and spiritual father of the nation. And since he was set apart by God for the very special purpose because God chose Abraham to begin a nation, a chosen nation of God. And since he was set apart for this special purpose, all his descendants that follow have also been set apart for the Lord. Entire generation down the road. But then some of these Jewish descendants have been broken off and passed over because of their unbelief in the Messiah. And because when the Messiah came, they not only rejected him, they crucified him, no, they murdered him, and they passed him to the hand of the Gentile to be murdered and killed, and they washed their hand and say, I'm not guilty. So they are stand judged for that. That generation of people who rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a consequence, what the non-Jews have been grafted unto the Messiah, the Abrahamic tree, and thereby have been offered the same opportunity for salvation that the Jews have been given. And because they rejected, they were being broken off. And now when they're broken off, now something else was but grafted on it. And when they become particle with the believer Jews by trusting in Christ by faith, what happened? They also reap. Reap what? They also reap the same benefit of salvation with the Jewish believers receive. Take a look in the following phrase. If some of the branches have been broken off, who are these branches? Those who rejected, those who uh, unbelief are the one, not the entire nations. Some the tree wasn't cut down, right? What the branches, those who rejected, and what happened after that? Yeah, the wild olive shoot, referring to the Gentiles, have been grafted in among others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. And using this metaphor. Paul gave a warning to these Gentile Christians. Now we have been but grafted in. How should we react? Now that we have been saved by grace through faith and receive a blessing that doesn't belong to us. And so Paul gave a warning to all 
the Gentile Christians. And this is the warning to all of us who are Christians who are now receivers of God's grace. And this is what Paul says. Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches that were being cut off. Don't think of it. If you do consider this, you do not support the root. Think about it. Who support you? If the root doesn't support you, even if you are bad grafted, then you are dead, right? But the root supported you. Or can you will say, ah, oh, branches are broken off so that I could be grafted. So he walked away. Huh? He moved away. Now I can see already. I think over the place. Now he moved away. So I think over. Huh? So he missed it. Huh? No, you cannot say that. Granted that. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And now you stand in by faith. So do not be arrogant. Do not be arrogant. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. So let us not take too pride that we have received the grace of God and look down on the Jews who have missed the plane or have been broken off. Don't do that. And after issuing this warning to the Gentile Christians, that we should not be too proud of what we are right now, Paul now focuses on God's plan in the future for the Jews who miss the plane. And what was God's plan? And what is God's plan for them? Huh? I haven't finished that. <laughs> he said, consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. If God can cut off the Jews who are chosen because of the unbelief, eh, cannot God do the same thing? If we continue to live in our arrogant and unrepented spirit like the Jews, he can do that to us as well. So, watch out. And now let's look at the plan. What plan has God prepared for the Jews? And this is listed for us in verses 23 all the way to 29. Uh, and here he tells us, And if they do not persist in unbelief, on our word, if they repent, the Jews finally come to the realization, oh yeah, we missed the plane. We missed the Messiah. I know that we killed him and we murdered him. Oh Lord, we are sorry. If they ever repent, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and then contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more ready Will this, the natural branches, be grafted into their own original olive tree? In these verses here, Paul tells us something. That God is doing something and waiting for that moment to receive back all the Jews who has turned away from him. Because the promise that God made will always stand. He will not change in His promise made. And He will fulfill every promise that He made. And this will tell us in verse 25 to 27. Let's take a look. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Speaking to who? Huh? Speaking to the Gentiles. Brothers and sisters, so that you may not be considered. So we are enjoying the blessing that belongs to someone. Don't be so arrogant. Don't be considered. Israel has experienced a hardening right now. God is hardening them just like He hardened the Pharaoh. You know, huh? And in part, until when? 
until a full number of Gentile has come in. God has elected the Gentile to save them. And when the number has come in, God is now ready to work among the Jews. And how God is going to work, I do not know. My people say that the Jews are very stubborn. Uh, until today, still very stubborn. Uh, but nothing is hard that God cannot break, right? If God can break my heart, He broke my heart and bring me on my knee before Him. And He can do the same for every one of us. Look, let's take a look uh, in the fallen words. Uh, what happened? And in this way, all Israel will be saved. And that generation come, uh, God will save all those Israelites. As it is written, the deliverer will come from where? Zion, the city of God in Jerusalem. And he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. Jacob is the nation of Israel, where the descendants come from. And this is my covenant with them. Not one, all of them. When I take away their sin, when they repent. It's a God's plan. Is that once the elected Gentiles has been saved, saved, Israel will be re-established as a holy nation with Christ as their ruler. But what happened right now? In the meantime, the Bible tells us the Jews, most of them, almost all of them right now, largely remains insensitive to the call of the gospel, even though they are the beloved of God. Look at verse 28 and 29. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. We are Gentile for our sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarch. The patriarch referred to who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Whatever God has promised, he will make sure that it will come true irrevocable. The things that we say, we revoke, right? <laughs> say only, but God is not. Uh, say only, but say Say only, but God is not. When God says something, He will keep it. He remember it, and He know it, and He will observe it. And that is our faith, the faithfulness of our God. Now, now that we have found the answer to the questions, huh, are they huh, falling beyond recovery? And we found, no, 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 it's not. What should be our response? I think, all right, huh, it's time for us. We have cleared all of this, and I think there are three things that we need to remember. With these thoughts behind us, we can now understand the message here in this passage fully, huh, and let us live with these three reminders what God is doing. To keep us humble and to remember where we come from. I always remind each one of us, we should be thankful of our parents. Without them, we are not here. Without the roots, there's no branches. Without the branches, there's no leaf. We should be thankful for how our parents remember them, where you come from. They are the number one in your family. Don't forget that. Be always thankful of that. Of course, uh, we don't put God out of the picture. Uh. Uh, we should thank God that He has given us parents. They are our roots that nourish us and the sap to give us life. And we will always be thankful for what they have done. And the same way the passage here tells us three important Truth. Number one, the Jews is calmly hardened. Yes, God is dealing with them. But ultimately, they are the beloved of God. 
they are still the beloved of God. No matter how much God disciplined them, no matter how much our parents discipline us, I sincerely believe that because they love us, we will not fully understand until someday we become parents. In the same way our Heavenly Father disciplined them, they do not understand. Why? I doubt they have come to see the picture yet. But when they do see the pictures, they realize they will come back to God. Secondly, concerning the Gentiles. The Gentile is spiritually honored right now. Oh, you are all living on cloud nine, enjoying the grace of God. But don't forget that we are personally undeserving. Remember that. So that you will live your life with gratefulness that whatever you have right now come from somebody who share with us. I mean, we share from us. Don't take too much pride that all oh, it is mine. Whatever you have right now, children, remember that the parent give it to you and be thankful for what they have given to you. Always keep that in your heart. And thirdly, what can we learn? The Lord is severe. Just as He is severe to the Jews because of the unbelief and rejection, but God is also fair to all. He disciplined every one of them. Whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, if we live in the stage of unbelief and ungratefulness, God will judge each one of us. We will not run away from it. I believe that God is a fair God. And what can we learn this morning as we come to the conclusions of this very difficult passage? And I think there are two things that we can draw from. God is patient. God is merciful. God is compassionate to all of us. And God wants us to share the same kind of patient, mercy, and compassion that he demonstrated. When Jesus used the same parable, remember the parable in Matthew chapter 18, 21 to 25 about the ungrateful servant? Remember? This man owed the master uh, about not 100 talents, 10,000 talents. That's a lot of money. Today, I think it's a billion dollars. A lot of money. Uh, I don't know how he siphoned the money, you know, and, and, and all money all gone, you know. And, then, and the master checked the account and gave the account. Oh, he owed 10,000 talent to the master. And the master said, Oh, you faithful servant, you know, you did this, you know, I trusted you and you stole all the money. And he began to plead before the master and say, Oh, master, please, 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 uh, uh, please don't sell me and my wife, you know, to the slave market so you can pay back the price. Give me a chance, please repent, please give me a chance. And what the master did? What the master did? The master forgave him. Cancer of the account. Okay. Give you a second chance. Gentiles. Not like that. Our sins were all forgiven. Now enjoy the grace. Shouldn't we be thankful? Shouldn't we be grateful? Yeah, we should be. But don't forget that God is holy, just, and stern to all of us. And just like this servant ungrateful servant. You know what he did? He went off, hi. <sighs> I thought I'm going to be dead already. And when he walked out, he saw his servant who owns him a hundred denarius. Oh my, it's not one percent of the ten thousand talents. Oh, so little. hundred denarius. He beat him up, force him, you know, I, you know, and torture him, you know, I... Uh, and all the other servants who saw what was happening, he said, oh, didn't this man learn the lessons? He was forgiven. All of us Gentiles were forgiven. Please don't look down on the Jews. Don't look down on other people who are not saved yet. 
They too also deserve God's grace. Don't take too much pride. Because God is going to be written. Which one of us have not sinned? Which one has kept every word of the law? We do fall, right? So let us be humble before God. Our Jews, our brothers. We are all descendants of Abraham. They are direct descendants. We are but grafted, right? By God's grace. Let us remember them in prayer. There will come a time that God will bring them all in. Let us not forget about the roots, where we come from. Whether we are Christian, or whether we are children of God, or children to our parents, let's not forget where we come from. So that God will bless us because we honor the root where we come from. May the Lord help each one of us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for these precious lessons that you have given to each one of us as a timely reminder for all of us. Let us remember that we are all sinners, undeserving. We are no better than the Jews. We are just the same. Because the Bible says there is no Jews, there's no Gentiles. All of us are sinners saved by grace. And we thank God that our great unfathomable plan that God has demonstrated, even through the life of Jews, He has poured it out for us to enjoy that salvation in Christ just by faith alone that we are saved. Oh, Father, we are thankful for that. And we want to remember the Jews too. That the blessing was supposed to be them, that they miss out. And they should be enjoying it. And we know the day is coming. The day is coming. Everything is happening because the Bible says whatever will happen will happen. Because God is going to gather all His people back. And together, we as Gentiles, Christians, and Jewish Christians, we will meet again together as one big family. Because we all come from the same root. We all come from God. And God chose to use Abraham to share the blessing with us. So we'll be thankful. And all of us should always be thankful about our parents. I know that God is sometimes we don't take it for granted. Actually, without my parents, I would be nothing today. Without the love they pour on of us, with the unconditional love they give to us, today we are gone. But yet, they make so much sacrifice for us. And just as God did that, and give His only Son on the cross for us, so that today we all enjoy the grace to Father Abraham. And help us to do just that, to be thankful, to remember them, to thank them for all of this. And help us to be very humble. Today, every achievement that we have in our life comes from someone's sacrifice. Today, our blessing comes from the sacrifice that Christ made, the sacrifice that Abraham made for all of us. And we should learn that lesson today so that we will learn to be grateful at all times. Oh, Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for this message. And thank you for the timely reminder for all of us. Oh, Father, we thank you, Lord. And this, Father, we ask in prayer. In Jesus' name, Amen.